Hello. Got nowhere to put my, my water. I think I have to use this thing over here. Hello there. How are you having a good time? No, that's not very good, is it? Um, no, oh dear. Shall I just go home? Do you need to go home? Or is it, are you waiting for the beers? Or are you waiting for the talking about Java? Do you need to talk more about Java? Um, you need to wait probably until after my talk, because I'm not really a Java programmer. I'm sorry about that. Um, I am a programmer. I've got the T-shirt. There we are, look. Um, and all you need is a T-shirt to be something. And, um, and I'm going to talk to you about programming, but not so much about Java. So I'm really sorry about that. But I'm sure many of the things I'm doing today could be uh, things you could try and... I oh, know, they're not really. Let's ignore that. Now, my thing is about trying to figure out how we, as people, can share our love and joys, and people use this terrible word passion all the time. Passion, passion, it's annoying. Um, joys and love and affections and excitement for programming with everybody else who, who doesn't really understand it. I mean, how many of you, this, I always say this at conferences, this is a really funny question, really, for me. Um, how many of you go to parties? Some of you, oh, quite a lot of you, that's pretty good, that's good. Yeah, well done, getting out socializing. How many of you go to parties and talk about programming? Yeah, well, yeah. How many of you, keep your hands up then, how many, how many of those parties are programming parties? Yeah, see? This is a problem. It's a problem, isn't it? Why can't we talk about programming to lots of other people who aren't programmers? I think it's a real problem. Because it means we can't share so much of what's inside of us, inside of our brains, inside of our hearts, with the people we care about and we love. Like my friend who plays the guitar, he has no problem going to parties and talking about his love for music. None, right? People say, what do you do? He's a musician. Oh, cool, you're a musician. What do you play? Right? So this is what I've stolen his idea, right? So <laughs> when I go to parties, it's not very often because I've got three kids. But <laughs> when I manage to get to them, people say, what do you do, Sam? I hide this, right? And I say, I'm a musician. They go, cool, what do you play? Code. Right? And at this point, I'm in. I've got an in, right? We're at least having a chat. They haven't run away screaming because like, what? Programming, music, that doesn't make any sense. You know, and then we were able to share and talk. And I think this is fundamentally important because it's not just about parties, it's about engaging with everybody. Because the same problem happens in schools. I mean, I've spent a lot of time, this system I'm about to show you, I showed you this morning and I'll perform later with it, is really designed to try and engage children in programming as much as uh, giving you something to talk about with your friends. And the problem is, uh, in the UK at least, it's not really a problem, it's fabulous, we have a new UK curriculum for computer science. That's amazing, right? So we're putting computer science at the same level as uh, physics or chemistry or biology, right? It's not there yet culturally, but at least on the curriculum, it's there, which is fabulous. The problem is that... For some reason, the people creating all of the schemes of work and all the, 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 the material to support teaching computer science have spoken to people like me and you and said, what excited you about programming? Because that's clearly the same thing that's going to excite everybody else, right? Because that's what you would do. You'd talk to the experts. So what did you like about uh, uh, programming? So <laughs> this then has given rise to some amazing schemes of work. Um, there was one, and this is by the way, a very, I won't name any names, but a very large, very important, very prestigious uh, uh, body which is providing this kind of material for teachers, uh, has a number of exciting titles to, to ravish the minds of a young person, to get them to do nothing else but computer science. Right, can you imagine what they might be? Have fun, right, that's a good start, with sorting. <laughs> And the other one f felt like, uh, I mean, it just, it's almost embarrassing, like uh, some sort of dodgy campaign for, for uh, uh, narcotics or something. Give binary a try. Because <laughs> <laughs> once you've tried it, you're never going to stop, right? You're going to be addicted to binary. And I don't know about you, but maybe that was the kind of thing that might have excited me and probably excited you. Because sorting is actually quite interesting when you get into the algorithms and all the complexities and the space-time trade-offs. There's some really interesting stuff in there. Right? There really is, and it is fun for some weird people like me and maybe some of you, but I just do, don't think it's the thing which is going to excite the majority of people. And it's certainly not what you're going to talk about in parties. <laughs> right? And, and actually, I, I talk about parties, I talk about school, how are they even related? Well, they're totally related because it's about, to me, it's about finding ways to engage people in what we do. 
And if we can't engage people at party, if we can't engage children in schools, how are we going to have this conversation which is going to broaden our participation? We're talking about diversity all the time. It's a really fundamentally pro problematic issue we have. And I think a solution to that diversity is to reach out to a broader audience, typically, ideally, at a younger age, just to get them all excited and get more of them involved. Right? And I think we have to accept that as we increase our diversity, we also have to broaden our focuses. How many of you here are programmers? Oh, that's good. How many of you work for businesses? See, that's a problem. It's a problem. I mean, how many people here play sports? Right? How many of you are professional sports people? Not many, right? Maybe I can't even see one single hand, right? We should, why have you bothered to do sports at all? Because it's a fabulous thing for our bodies, for our minds. It's great experience. It's good team building. It's good for synchronization. There's, there's lots of positive attributes and benefits from doing sports, which has nothing to do with being a professional sports person. I think similarly is the case of programming. And it's a, it's a shame that, we have, that most of the programmers in this world are limited to within a business context. It's not a bad thing. We need business programmers, absolutely. I'm not saying anything negative about business programming. But it's not the only aspect of programming, is it? Like, um, like just, just, just as a thought experiment, imagine the same for written language. Imagine if written language was only ever used, in the majority of cases, by lawyers. Right? The only written words you would see are legal documents and contracts. Right? Uh, what, what have we lost? We've lost poems, we've lost rap lyrics, we've lost stories, to-do lists, shopping lists, text of friends, all sorts of fabulous... And I would say the majority of the interesting aspects of writing is, is not legal documents, to be honest. It's everything else. What is the everything else of programming? Are we missing that? I think we are. I think we're yet to discover it. I and mean, There's bubbles of it everywhere, but I think there's a really exciting frontier of programming that's yet to be uh, discovered. And I think we should be trying to figure out what they are and, and trying to engage a broader audience to get them doing that. And that's not to say we should stop doing business programming. Of course we could, should carry on. But it's, we should be expanding our audiences and not being so narrow and focused on things which make rich people richer or people uh, uh, making more money for, for, for shareholders. And I mean, this, so this software I'm showing you now is entirely free, it's entirely open source. It was funded by a majority by a charity, so the Raspberry Pi Foundation have funded the majority of this work, which has been fabulous. Uh, and uh, the sad thing to me is I'm sure that uh, many of you are capable of doing beautiful projects, but just don't have the freedom yet to do it. So in our society, we need to figure out ways to fund these kinds of projects that aren't, don't necessarily have a commercial benefit, but may have an important social benefit i.e. having you be able to talk to more people at parties and also to be able to gauge children uh, to a, in a more interesting, exciting way. Does this make sense? Right? I don't know. I'm not, hopefully I'm not offending you too much um, because you're all business programmers and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm an academic. Um, yeah, I should say I'm a researcher at the University of Cambridge Computer Laboratory um, and this is my research output. So this, uh, not that ASCII art, that's quite fun, but you saw this morning, right? Uh, I made some music, and the thing is, right, you, you see these people doing amazing things. Artists can do fabulous things, so they just uh, blow your mind. But often, and not always, but often, the, the mystique of what they're doing is part of their act or part of their artistry, such that when you try and ask them, how did you do that, they kind of often can be reserved and, and don't necessarily, are uh, not so hugely forthcoming with the process within which they got to the, the end results. Sometimes because that process is unknown to them, but also sometimes it's kind of their secret source. And for me, I want to make sure that anything that I do, you can do better than me. That's the goal. Uh, and anybody can do better than me. So I'm going to make sure that everything I'm doing, the, the, the tools to do it, the process to learn, to get engaged, is all and completely available. And if it's not, if it's not understandable, that's my fault, and I'll do my best to try and fix it. And so here's the first program you can write with Sonic Pi. It's just two words, uh, uh, the word play, which is kind of like have fun with sorting, but there's a the fun bit. And then there's this number thing, right? And what do numbers do? I ask this all the time, and nobody seems to know. Numbers, they go up and down. They measure. 
They measure, yeah, they get what they count, right? And so the cool thing about programming is we're always looking for relationships between mathematics and abstractions and the real world. Because we, when we can find this relationship, then we can start to model it, right? And so with numbers, we can model things which can go up and can go down. So like my height can be mod modeled with a number, right? And similarly, the pitch of the notes can also be measured and modeled with this number, right? So higher notes, lower notes. Let me get to test the system here. Let's try this. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of times, I did this in a, in a cinema in the Netherlands, and it was obviously the cinema has insane bass. Everyone's in their comfy chairs. <laughs> as it came out, right? So it was good fun. Uh, and then obviously in schools and things, they have little tinny speakers, and you can't hear this at all. So you can start to uh, appreciate the, uh, the range of your speaker system, right? Similarly, can't hear that either unless you're a bat or something or a space alien. Um, and this is fun, right? So you're able to, to, to perceive the range of, of hearing. And what are these numbers? Well, they kind of relate to notes on a piano. So if I'm going up from a white note to a black note or a black note to a white note, this is a whole integer increase in tone. But of course, I can, I can use fractions as well. So I'm capable of producing any frequency. That's great. So that's the first, that's the first win. The second win is, uh, and that may confuse you as well, I'm not sure, to imagine what this might do. So this is always good exercise when you're playing with Sonic Pi. Write some code, hear it in your head first before you press play. So try and play that, execute that code in your head, and then compare it to what you just heard. Now, there's a couple of ways of explaining this. The first way is that computers, I don't know if you knew this already, but they're very fast, aren't they? Yeah. So we're going to do line one, then line two sequentially, but so quickly we can't perceive the difference. Right? That's, that's the simple way. But, but if some of you might have looked on the right-hand side and think, what's the nonce saying there? Well, it's saying actually at time zero, I'm playing both of those notes. So this system has a very strong sense of time. We're not strongly typed. We're strongly timed. And this is not a thing I've invented. There's, there's languages like Chuck, for example, have done strong timing for a while. But it's really important when we're making music that we care about not just the order of execution of things. So do this, then do this, then do the other, but don't do this until this is completed. Right? This is a typical important aspect of programming. Here we're saying do this on time. It's really important, because if you've got a drum rhythm, right, you don't care that this drum is hit after this drum. That's not the important thing. You want that and on the right time. Otherwise, the drum rhythm just goes to, goes to uh, yeah, not good. So there we are. So, that's, that's the, so now we can play chords, which is pretty cool. So I can play another note here. That's good. Ooh. Now, if we want to make a melody, there's one more command to know, and that's the sleep command. Lovely. Look at here. That's nice, isn't it? Now, uh, some of you are obviously super excited by this. I can see already that person over there is super excited. That one there is running off to do it themselves. That person is dancing, right? Because you've all realized this is the majority of Western notation for music. I can make any melody, any bass line, any riff with those two commands. If you think about it, what is, the most, what is a piece of music? It's which note to play and when to play it. And we've got which note to play, and by adding the right sleep times between the notes, we can choose precisely when to play it. And so now we can literally make any melody. Obviously, it's not going to sound great. There's a bunch of other stuff, like expression, and what about the length of the note? They're all the same length. And the, the timbre, that's a fancy word for the sound of a sound. Like the, a guitar sounds different to a saxophone, sounds different to a voice. And here we've got this really, really basic sine wave, which is the simplest sound that we can see. And you can even see on the this like curvy thing. Uh, is, is, the, is the sine wave, right? Um, so we've got, we're missing a few things, but the essence is there. And this, is, this shouldn't surprise you if you've looked at kids' programming languages like, like Logo, where you've got pen down, pen up, rotate, and forward, right? With those four commands, you can draw any picture, which is pretty crazy, and kids do. So with these two commands, you can make any melody. And, I mean, uh, this morning, Kevin was saying something really interesting about being depressed by looking at uh, the, the, the software engineering sort of events happened in the 60s and not much has changed. I had a similar experience where I, I watched Cynthia Solomon, one of the original Logo programmers, talk about the work they were doing in the 60s and 70s with kids. And it's often way more advanced than we're doing today. So the same thing is true. You know, we still haven't really moved forward. I'm going like, look at me, I've made this thing. It's got 
<laughs> we were doing this in the 60s in, in a better way. So this is, I'm not saying any of this is new. I'm just saying it's available and we can play with it today. So what else can we do? Now, this is the important thing, I think, is that uh, although we've got most of Western music at this point, it's not that exciting. Hopefully, you, you might agree. Some of you might think it's exciting. Great. Other people are like, well, I want a bit more. And this is the thing where programming allows us to take this into new and exciting directions. Right? So although this maps and models to a large chunk of notes and dots on lines and staves and notation for violins and, and clarinets, as programmers, you're thinking, oh, I could write functions, I could write uh, mapping functions, or I can write data structures, or I can bring in all sorts of interesting data and manipulate it and turn it to sound. Like, you, your mind's probably going crazy with the kinds of things you could do with this. And that's what's exciting. Like, we as programmers can take these building blocks and do insanely cool things with them. And that's, that's what I'm excited about. And I'll, I'll show you the, some of the things that I've done with these building blocks. And the first thing to think about is that, well, I mentioned that uh, uh, everything has the same duration, right? So it lasts for one second. So I can change the release time to short, right, or longer. And this, we go to the, the tutorial, we've got this idea of an envelope where it goes from quiet to loud instantly. So it's like a clap sound, goes from quiet to loud, very instantaneous, and then fades out over some duration of time. And that duration of time is called release. And we can see here, we're specifying the release time here. But of course, we can also put in this attack time, so we can fade in the sound. So if I say attack two as well, comes in and comes out. So we have this fine control over the sound. Some of you who know about synthesizer music will recognize this as what's called an ADSR envelope, attack, sustain, decay, release. These are various stages. So you can totally modulate the amplitude in lots of interesting ways. So this, this is possible. You can even change the curves of these things if you really want to go into it. So changing the duration is something we can totally do. Um, and what about the timbre? Well, so in the real world, uh, you can go and buy synthesizers. That's Synthesizer, let's Google for this. I'm English, so we spell it with an S. Um, and here we are, some images. So these chaps here, right? So these synthesizers often come uh, with many different voices. I'm trying to get a picture of them. Yeah, oh, there we are. Uh, and you can select off some different things going on. And so you have different controls, but you also have different voices as well. Um, and you can have different synthesizers. And here in this case, the default synthesizer is the beep synthesizer. So by specifying it, it may, I'm just, just overriding the default, but the default is the beep synthesizer, so we're not getting anything new there. We're just making it clear that we're using the beep synthesizer. But I have a bunch of others built in, so let's try the chip lead. Oh, that's nice. And maybe let's try and make it sound a bit lower, let's reduce the octaves. Um, chip lead. So we can do, obviously do some basic arithmetic in our notes. We're not just having to put numbers in there. And also, if we know a bit of Western notation, we can even write like... So we can write our notation like this. That's fun. Uh, so we can change these things. And, but also, the, um, these synthesizers have all these crazy controls. Look at this one. It's got loads of them. Right? And we want to be able to change these parameters, which will change the sound of the sound. Well, we've already got a couple of parameters here which are changing the duration of the sound. And if we look at the documentation for, say, chip lead, we can see that all these black things, I'm not expecting to read it, but there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen different knobs to twiddle and, and tweak. And they all have defaults, which which are, if you don't specify them, are the defaults. So this is like a hash map of key value pairs. And you have a hash map of defaults, you have your own overrides, and you merge them together, and then the ones which clobber win and specify the sound. So let's change, uh, let's go to profits, quite a fun one. And let's, uh, let's just have a release of eight. And let's say the cutoff. What on earth is cutoff? Well, let's just choose a low value. It's an ominous, booming sound, right? That's quite fun. Now, some of you might have noticed that the note didn't finish before the next one started. We're overlapping, right? So we're already in a threaded environment. Every time the screen goes pink, I'm creating a new thread, and that thread is executing. And you can see I'm calling these threads runs, and it knows when the thread is completed. And the thread will wait for all the synthesizers it's triggered to complete before it completes. Um, so you can see that when I run this, it's starting. 
We wait for the synthesizer to complete, and when it's completed, ah, oh, come on, there we are. There, it's finished. Right, so, um, so this, these these are threads running, and but we so we can layer them on top of each other, and this is a lot of fun. So you can really just play by having a couple of simple lines and just la layering the sounds over each other. That's one way of working. Um, another way of working is to use iteration. So. Let's choose like eight times do. So we're in a like Ruby DSL here. One, two, five, and and so if we instead of doing release of eight, do release of 0 0.1. There we are. So, um, and let's make this maybe lower. So now we can do things like having a ranged random value between 70 and 130, which is fun. There we go. But it, did you, can you hear that? Let's make this even more clear. So it's choosing the same random values every single time. I mean, let's, let's make this really clear. Watch. If I print rand, it's there, 0 0.75006103, whatever. Oh, it's the same value. That's the same value. It's the same value. So this is already interesting as well. We, we need randomization in music because it's super fun to play with, and it gives us the ability to get the computer to make some choices. So instead of having to hand control all the different dials, we can ask the computer to randomly choose the dials. But the cool thing is that, well, the problem is, especially with these synthesizers, once you've found some cool values, it's really hard to reproduce it, especially if it was random. Like If it's proper random with full entropy, you can't reproduce it. That's the point. But we're not doing crypto here. We're making music. And so you don't need full rando. And what you actually care about is the ability to reproduce it. So the cool thing is, if I liked this, that was my riff, right? And I wanted to, I don't know, loop it forever. Oh, actually, it is. Now it's going, now it's going random, right? What I can do is, in here, I can put a random, I can set the seed. Hear that repeating around, right? And if I make it even more obvious, I can, I don't know, put a list of notes, A2, A, A3, and choose one of those. Right? So we've got this repetition, right? And, and this is really important because I might like that. That might be the core of my track. Uh, and maybe I'm working with one of you who might be doing vocals or playing a bass or guitar to it. I can just email you this code. And you can put it in Sonic Pi in your version, and you'll hear the same thing. Right? So what's this called in programming? Determinism. Right? So what we've got here is a ter deterministic system. And we've got the multi-threaded program as well, and it's still deterministic. So there's some really interesting computer science problems that need to be solved. And I'm not saying I've solved them. Obviously, these have been solved many, many times before. But for this particular context, to, to make sure that despite the fact we have multiple threads, and despite the fact we've got multiple architectures and multiple machines, having the same thing happen on all machines the same way. Because every piece of code should produce the same piece of music. It gives us real power to be able to reproduce stuff and share stuff. This is really, really important. And it's obviously important for things like testing, right? Uh, determinism is an important thing. So there we go. Now, the problem with this is I'm using this loop. And loops are terrible. Like, I don't know how useful you find loops. But I mean, unless you're just reading from a socket forever, like if you're writing Nginx loop, Socket, 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 right? Unless you're doing that, th th if you want to ever change what the code is doing, that, it's, not, it's, it's a bit of a problem. So, uh, because watch, if I, if I run this, and maybe I want to change this to how I know, E5. No, let's just swap that around. It's late, it's, we've got two threads running at the same time now. And if I change this to 0.3, We've got another thread, right? So we're just adding threads on top of threads on top of threads, and they're just blushing and complying and, and not really doing what we want. So loops are terrible because they're black holes. And the fun thing is, I found, was that kids will do this, right? So you can actually call samples. I haven't showed you this yet, but you can play any pre-recorded sound. So let's just get a bass drum in here. Uh, sleep for 0.5, right? Right, this is, this is it. This is the start of my dance track, right? Good. Right, so we've got that. Kids understand this. And within a couple of hours, kids are doing that. And they'll write another loop. And I don't know, sample, uh, guitar, E minor 9. That's where we are. Seat for 8. Let's go for 8. And they have this. And they say, right, well, my drums and my guitar are at the same time, right? So they will write this. And this happens all the time. I, I was, it was crazy. 
Ah, oh, why is it not working? <laughs> now, hopefully, you should all know this. I won't have to explain it. Um, but you do have to explain it to children, right? And you explain, well, actually, what's happening is the program goes into line four, and then it does line five, line six, line seven, which then loops back to four, and we spin around between four and seven forever. Right? Or we never get to line nine, so we never hear our guitar. And we can prove that right, by, by just swapping these loops around. So if I just take this loop and just m move it up, uh, oh, I'm just deleting it. Here, we're only hearing the guitar, not the drums, right? Now, I found this really deeply frustrating because kids want to do this, I want to do this, you will soon want to be able to do this, right? Um, and if you're in a school situation, the answer is you've got to wait till university. <laughs> because we need this thing called threads and it's not on the curriculum, sorry. Right, and the, can you imagine, and this happened to me a number of times, and the, this kid's face, like, they're all like perplexed and slightly angry and bewildered. Like, why, why aren't we, why can't we do this? And the, the problem is that you could totally teach the kid threads, but the teachers would not give you a second of their time because it's not on the curriculum. And certainly in the UK, everything's geared for tests and points and league tables and all this sort of stuff, which means that any time spent not focusing on the thing which is going to be examined by the league tables is a waste of time, which it clearly isn't, right? In this case, all the children I've ever worked with want to do this. So this is where, as programmers, we can use our amazing skills to cheat the system, right? So what we do is we invent a new kind of loop Right, so Kevin said there's only so many kinds of loops you've already seen already. Well, here's a new one. It's called a live loop. <laughs> so we just slightly change its name, and then we run it, and then, oh, we get an error. But the error says, look, live loop needs to have a unique name. Now, what are we doing? We're anthropomorphizing, I guess that's a too big word for me to even say. We're, we're turning these loops into people, right? We, they're band members, right? So uh, I might want to be in this band, but maybe there's, uh, let's uh, think. Maybe Jenny is playing the guitar, and Sarah is playing the drums, right? And so by giving the live loops names, oh, I shouldn't put commas there. I don't know why I did that. We've got them both to play at the same time. So we've got, yes, we win. So we don't tell the teachers we're doing concurrency. No, 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 no. Um, shh, so I'm telling the world this, but no, no, they're just special kind of loops. They're the Sonic Pi loops. And uh, they just happen to be able to play at the same time, right? It doesn't really matter. Uh, and then the cool thing about these live loops is that not only do they support concurrency, but I can common things out whilst they're still running and it's still spinning around. You can still see uh, Sarah on the right hand side. And then uncomment them out, right? Or I can change the low pass filter on this to change the rate to this. It's going to go half speed. See, that's nice, right? So we have concurrency and we have the ability to hot swap the code. Right? And I mean, there's a quick sort of explanation of what's happening. We're, we're combining threads, functions, and loops in one go. So the implementation of live loop essentially is to spawn a thread. And that thread's body is a, is a loop, which is calling a function. And it also redefines a function of the same name of itself. What does that mean? Well, when I run the code, uh, it tries to create a thread called Jenny. And also, you can only have one thread called Jenny that exists at the same time. So we try and create a thread called Jenny. If she doesn't exist, we make her. Boom, there she is. And then we give her the uh, instructions to, to execute. So we create a function called Jenny. And the body of the function is just to play the sample guitar and sleep for eight seconds. And then we loop calling the function. And then when we redef redefine the function, or redefine the live loop, it will redefine the function. It will not create a new Jenny, because Jenny is already existing. And then Jenny, when she spins around, will call the, the, the new function. So that way, we're hot swapping the code, but in a way which works with time. So we're not halfway through spinning the whole function out and putting a new one in, because that would just it would go a bit crazy. We're waiting for the boundary of the loop to complete, and then we have an opportunity to slip a new function definition in there. Uh, and that's all that's doing. Um, and this forces uh, uh, clean code, because we're not uh, executing arbitrary code uh, on the screen. Everything has to be there. And it also allows us to, to have multiple things at the same time, uh, like this. And we can even redefine Jenny multiple times if you wanted to. And the last one wins. That's uh, Let's just show you that. If I just do that and then comment it out. Well, the first Jenny defined it, the second Jenny redefined it again, and then we can't hear it because of that. 
Um, so there we go, so that's live loop, and that's the sort of fundamental principle for performance. So at the beginning here, where I do like play 70, and seat for one, and whatever, play 70, this is composition. So I'm asking that I'm doing a sequential ordering of the program, do this, do that, do the other, um, and I can totally imagine writing a really complex piece that does all of this, like uh, load example, here's one, I, I didn't prepare this earlier, uh, uh, is it Bach, yeah, yeah, we are. The fabulous chap called Robin Newman wrote this, and it's just really the same. Play, I'm using this play pattern timed, which is essentially a compression of play and sleeps. So it's like play 72, sleep for 0.25, play 74, sleep for 0.25, this kind of thing. And then you can have a piece of bark, right? So you can imagine this kind of thing. Um, although it's quite fun to mess around with it. Like uh, you can, whatever. Yeah, or like D saw. Start messing around with that thing, um, but th that's quite different to this kind of thing, which is a few live loops where. And then if I left it going like that, it would just repeat forever and it'd be super boring, right? So the key is change it. by modifying the code a little bit, you can, you can keep it evolving, right? So it's on you to keep changing it, otherwise it will stay static. So these are two different ways of playing and performing, and I think it's really exciting to be able to put these in the hands of children um, and to, to see what they can do with them. They are doing some amazing things, which is quite fabulous to see. Um, right, so where are we? And there's a few more. Can I show you some tricks you can do with this? So uh, let's go like 8.times, do play E1, release time short, sleep for 0.125, and... Too low, so let's try make it higher. Or I can like take a scale, E3. If you're ever unsure about what you should do, always use a minor pentatonic scale. It says, always sounds good. The top tip. It's like playing the black notes on the keyboard. So if I tick through this, it's quite nice, yeah. Uh, or if I can pick one. Now, what children want to be able to do is they want to say, well, that sounds nice, but I want it to sound like it's in a big room. I want to have some kind of reverb, right? They don't, may not know, use the word reverb. Now, this is, uh, this is quite tricky in most of these live coding languages because they're, they're designed to, to give you lots of power, and often that power comes with complexity of the code. Uh, and I was thinking, well, how do, I, how do I slip in things like reverb into a computer science lesson? Because clearly that's not on the curriculum. If, if concurrency is not on the curriculum, reverb is definitely not on the curriculum, right? Uh, and the thing is, some kids get a bit bored of the simple sounds and they want something more interesting. And so you want to be able to go around and just give them a bit of a nudge and say, well, try this, and not have it disturb the rest of the class, but still give them something to play with. So what is the simplest way of adding reverb? Well, in Ruby, one of the coolest things about Ruby is we have these do n blocks. Uh, it's really aw awesome, because they, what they do is they basically represent an anonymous function which can be implicitly passed to any other method, right? And so once you've got one of these do n blocks, so you think, oh, which method am I going to pass it to? In this case, I've got a with effects reverb method. Um, and so it allows me essentially to define a context within which I can modify stuff. Right? So what I'm doing here is internally within the synthesizer I've, uh, I've been working with, it's something called Super Collider, I I create a reverb, so it's almost like going to the shops, buying a reverb pedal, plugging it in, and then ensuring that every synthesizer that's triggered within its context goes through the reverb. And then I also make sure that I wait for all of the things which are using that reverb, for all the synthesizers to die and finish, before then I destroy the reverb and tidy it up. So it's kind of like allocation, deallocation, sort of synthesizer garbage collection going on. Um, and so this is really important because otherwise you end up with millions of reverbs and it'll take up all the CPU, uh, especially if you put it in like a loop that goes on forever. But now, 
can hear that's a bit of reverb, but if I use the knobs and crank it up, it's nice, isn't it? So then I can maybe go higher. And there's loads of these effects. So there's Bit Crusher, or Crush. So you can take any sound and completely obliterate it with these different effects, which is huge fun. And you can even nest them as well, right? Um, what am I doing wrong? Oh, 1G. So you can nest these arbitrarily, and hopefully some of you are, are uh, closet Lisp programmers will be quite excited by the fact we're doing things correctly here. We're going from the inside out. That's nice. Um, and so, I mean, I, if I could write it in Lisp, I would, but unfortunately, that's, schools don't seem to see it. Right? But in the UK, if it's not Python, it's not programming, which is a problem. Um, Ruby is pretty close to Python, so I'm able to get it past the, uh, the head teacher test. So there we go. So you can add effects, which is huge fun. And that's really simple to do. Um, and then the other thing, which I, I, I'm really quite pleased about, there's lots of different things. I, mean, I haven't got a huge amount of time to show you, uh, is the fact you can take a sample like this loop arm end break. And right, this is that famous, famous drum break, right? It's a bit loud. Right, that's like going back to Bristol, not from my hometown. Well, I used to live in Bristol. Um, and here I can then change the rates. We saw that briefly before with the guitar. I mean, that's just basically saying, let's walk through the data points in the WAV file. The WAV file is just a list, a list of points where the microphone moved when the air hit it, based on where the drum had caused the air to compress and decompress. But that's just a list of numbers. And you can map through that list of numbers at the normal rate, or you can go slowly. And if you go slowly, it turns into hip hop. Right, so like, like seriously, NWA used the same track, same sample at half speed and wrapped on top. Or you can do this, speed it up a bit, and you go straight into jungle. Right, we're there, which is huge fun. So the one sample you can mess around with it. But a lot of things, especially in the jungle days, what people would do is they would take the arm end break as a WAV file and then cut and paste it, all the different bit drums, in different orders over time to make a new track, which is painful and painstaking. And it wouldn't be great if the computer could help us do this. Well, if I create a live loop, put this in here, and ask for onset zero. Oh, and here's another interesting thing as well. Here, I, I, I created a live loop, I did something, and then I didn't sleep. And the kids always ask me about this. Why does this not work? Well, I'm asking it to, think about it, do an infinite number of things in zero time. It's not going to work. So I, te I test for that. So I make sure that you have to have at least one sleep in there. Otherwise, it will try and spin around as fast as it possibly can and burn out. And in the early days, with the, certainly with the Raspberry Pis, it really did lock the whole machine. <laughs> and you had to turn it off and turn it on again. Um, so now, here we are. We're off. And you can see with a few lines of code, you can start to do this interesting thing. So this is using an open source library called Orbio, which does uh, feature detection on the WAV file, finds all the points where the WAV file goes from low energy to high energy, and says that's probably where there's going to be a drum hit or a bass hit. And with the same algorithm, the same code, Envelopes of the sample and change the, 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 the duration, the length of these things, right? So, again, uh, it's, it's really quite fun to think about how, as a programmer, could I build something that's simple, and that, especially something that's simple enough for a 10 year old child to use, and then see what I can do with it. And it turned out, I mean, that I built this other thing with a friend called Jeff Rowe called Overtone, which was a similar kind of environment, except for using this nice uh, environment where you just download it and it just works with a text editor. I was using this, what, what, have you ever seen this thing? 
This, this, what's this, Emacs thing, have you ever seen that? I was using Emacs for performing with that, and I was, this is C++, I was writing Clojure code, uh, let's find some Clojure code, so in here we have Sonic Pi, etc. cetera, synth devs, uh, designs, Sonic Pi, synths, some basics, so here's some, some lovely Clojure code, and here I was defining all the synthesizers in, in Clojure, and I was also not just defining with them, I was also performing with them. Um, and so this was actually running on the JVM, so I did do JVM programming. Um, but the problem was, no one could do this, really. Now, I even I gave talks at the Clojure conferences, and they were like, wow, this is cool. But no one really got beyond the <laughs> noises, <laughs> because you have to design your own synthesizers to make a sound, and that's a, that's a whole skill set in itself. Um, and also, you've got to download this Java thing, and Maven thing, and JARS, you know, and you've got to set the class path up, and or you've got to make sure that they, you use the right garbage collector to reduce the pause times, and <gasps> like, my mum's not going to do that. Um, and so this, this was a problem, so it really limited the, 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 the breadth and the audience. And as I was saying before, I think it's really important to think about how do we broaden the audiences who we're talking to. And if we put barriers to entry, at which is all those things, that, that actually really limits the, the potential set of people. I mean, even you guys, right, and ladies, some of you might have a JVM on your computers, but how many of you use Emacs? How many of you use Clojure? It's a few, right? So it's some of you, but how many of you are representative of the, of the population? Right? How many of your mums could do this? No. Oh, yes, this person here, fabulous. I'd like to meet her. She'd be really cool to hang out with. Um, so, so the thing is about this is you've got an app you can just download and it just works, and it's simple. Um, and the, the, the problem with the, the closure thing was that it was just, I was able to perform at parties, so that was just great fun, but nobody could reproduce it, nobody could copy it, it was, nobody could learn how to do it. And that was a fundamental problem. And so trying to make something that was simple and easy has is, is really been beneficial. And it also turns out that <laughs> before I do gigs sometimes, I'd be like setting up the JVM and linking the, get, hooking Emacs in, and it was always scary, because it would never quite work quite rightly, and it would always take a bit longer than I was expecting, and it was always a worry whether I was actually able to make a sound. And so that complexity of both the programming and the, and the environment led to huge stress. And that's not what you want when you perform. Well, you're a guitarist, you don't want to plug it in and it just works. And so this is, a, this is a real problem. And having a simple system is not just good for teaching kids how to code, it's also good for quite stressed Sam and are quite stressed you in front of a large audience, because simple things are easy to reason about. The cognitive load is much lower, and so it's much more fun, really, to actually play with. So a simple system, even though I designed it initially for kids and for schools, thinking it was just going to be a toy, and I was going to use my crazy closure system for my performances, turned out to be the system that was actually more fun to play with. And this is also to do with time as well. So it's not timing of the programming environment, but time of development. You always have these arguments. Is Scala more powerful than Java? Is Kotlin the best language in the future? Is, like, and we have these d d discussions about what maybe you, or maybe you couldn't express in a particular language, and how expressible it is. And we never really talk about how long it takes to express it. Like, if we could express something in Scala, but it takes us a week, is that better than something in Ruby that takes us a day? I'm not saying all the, all the inverse, right? We never really talk about how long it takes because that's not really what we think about. We're thinking about the, the, the ability to express it, not the process within which we do the expression. And when we perform with the code, which is not a normal thing, I, I admit, the, the duration it takes to, to create something is vital. If I'm going up and having to write lots of text, that's already bad. But if I'm having to think about complicated things, we saw this morning, if I'm going to write explicit loops with counters, to do some basic filtering, that's a lot of cognitive load that, that, that I haven't got in that moment. So simple systems, which are s quick to program, to quick to go from thought to output, tend to be, at least from my perspective, much more expressive, because you can try more things more quickly, and that's way more fun to, to, to play around with. Now, what's the time? Are we doing five minutes left? Right, so, where are we with all of this? So, we've got a system, we can make music, we can play samples, we can chop samples up, we can play different synthesizers, we can add reverb, we can teach programming languages, we can also teach music with this, and we can actually start to realise that programming and music aren't, aren't dissimilar, and in fact, science and art are not dissimilar. It's only a recent catastrophic separation of these two things, where we, we, for some crazy reason, we see science in its own silo from art. That would never used to be the case. 
They were like, in the, in the Renaissance, people were talking about science, and we were putting crazy maths and, and, and angles in all their photos. You know, it was photos, paintings, they didn't have photos. Um, and the, so the, the, these things were combined, and you would, the artists would be using the latest technologies, the latest paintbrushes, or the latest paint, or the latest techniques to produce their arts. Right, so they were often were on the bleeding edge of science. If you, if you look at Picasso, he was on the bleeding edge of, of photography, you know, and, and that really impacted his work. And Gertrude Stein, her writing was directly impacted by, by, by photography as well, and repetition, and context, and philosophy. So I think that, that for some reason we separate these things, and hopefully tools like this force us to realize that they shouldn't be separated. They should also force us to realize that, that coding is not just for business. As I was saying before, it's for everything, everybody, and expression. And then if we, if we break things out of business and put them into non-commercial sort of context, I think that can have a big impact on the, the broad diversity of audiences we can reach. And I think that's really important. And not everything that's useful is going to be commercial. And we have to realize that and, and see that as an important, important aspect. And, and then we need to start to think about how we can, how we can start to, to ourselves have, have a lot of fun with these kinds of things. And using our powers as programmers, because we have amazing powers to do things which have real impact that people care about. And there's some really fabulous things that have happened with this. And there's Finland sent a bus to Africa to teach 2,000 Africans, predominantly women, children, how to code which is fabulous, because they're celebrating their, their 100 years of independence. And what do they use? They use Sonic Pi. It was great. And then when I was in Helsinki last, I got to meet 12 African delegates from 12 different countries. And they all gave me the biggest hugs it was I could possibly imagine. And it was the smiles on their faces and the videos of watching these African kids just grinning and dancing to the music they were coding. It was just a beautiful thing to see. And so, more of that, please, right? What can we do to do more of that kind of stuff? And obviously, if, if tools at Sonic Pi cost money, then that's not really going to be uh, uh, something that, that, that people are going to... to, to have. Well, basically, it raises the barrier to entry. And what, what I'm all about is trying to create uh, experiences, creative experiences of code. And if, if it's, oh, you need to buy a MacBook Pro, that's a massive barrier. So this thing runs on a Raspberry Pi computer. So for 30 euros, you can have a music-making computer coding device. Uh, the software is free, and it also has, as we sort of briefly looked at, a full tutorial written in, which is basically a full book. It's like 40 or 50,000 words. And it's been translated to multiple languages. And if it hasn't been translated to your language, please join us. We've got, we've got a website where you can uh, uh, we are crowdsourcing the translations to get involved and to add things. Right, I think this is pretty much it, really. Um, what I would like to try and finish off with is that um, if you're interested in helping, then please let me know. That would be great. I'm always looking for people who've got ideas and thoughts, or if you're a designer, or if you're a programmer, or whatever. If you want to get involved, then please let me know. If you think projects like this are important for our society, then I think a really tough question to ask is how on earth do we fund them? Because I've discovered that it's remarkably hard to get people to see value in free things. And that's tragic. It's tragic. Like, why is it? If some people, and, and we have almost a million users using Sonic Pi, so there is clearly value. Teachers are using it all over the world to teach, you know, both computer science and music. There's value there. But people don't seem to actually properly value it enough to see it want to continue. And how on earth in our world do we try and, and especially when, uh, if you've got something which is valuable that can be freely reproduced infinitely, right, which is what software is, why do we not like, have, have the most value on those things? It's nuts. Why is it that a really fancy pair of boots costs tons of money when it actually costs not much money to actually manufacture, yet things which actually can actually give a value to our society? So, see, we don't seem to perceive a value. So that, that's a problem. So figuring out how we can fund more projects like Sonic Pi that maybe you could create or your friends could create, that's a really open question. And if you have any ideas, please let me know, because I'm really desperately looking to tr figure out how I can continue to do this. My funding runs out in about four months. And so after that, then uh, there's no more development on Sonic Pi, which would be quite tragic. So, uh, I mean, I have a Patreon thing if you want to get involved, but really I'm looking for a, a sustainable answer to this question, not just for me, but for other projects. So I'd like to see, if, if I could magically give all of you money to work on whatever you wanted, just imagine the things we could build together. Right? Imagine the things you could do with your programming skills that don't necessarily have to have a commercial output, 
but have to have a valuable output to our societies, what could they be? And I think that's a really thing to think about and to enjoy. And for me, that's music and Sonic Pi. You've seen what, I, what you can do with it. Hopefully, you've seen how you can take this home and play with it. Um, and I'll show you that if you practice this every day, as I do, Later on tonight at the party, you can show you what you can do with it, which is really exciting. Um, and I hope that it'll get you involved enough to actually share this and, and these ideas with your actual friends who aren't necessarily programmers. And we could all go to parties and talk about programming. That would be great. Thank you very much.